Hi everyone, this is Pam Varner here and with this project I'm going to show you how to make a spider web on either just a little wall hanging or any project that you have for Halloween. So I'm going to pull this up a little bit so you can see the spider web and also the spider and the legs. So the legs are actually quilted with templates as well as the entire web. So for this project you're going to want a 17 by 21 inch of your top fabric. I suggest you do something that's light colored. This works well because it has a little tiny print in it. You also want 18 by 22 inch backing and batting. You can use fat quarters for this project if you would like. That works very well. You're also going to want basting spray. I used June Taylor's Quilt Basting Spray. It's just a nice fine mist spray. And you're going to want a light thread that matches your background. So I used a cream colored thread here and that is for the background quilting and then you're going to want a black thread to do the spider web. So let's talk about the tools that we're going to use to make this. First of all we want to use our eight point crosshair square. So this is very important to get the lines in the spider web. For the templates we're going to use the 12 inch arc. I'm sure you're all very familiar with. I don't know if you can see here, but I have put a line on the top of my template. I did that by putting just a piece of clear tape and then drawing the line with a marker. So we're going to use this line for our spacing for the background quilting. It's just easier to see on light colored thread and fabric if there's some kind of marking on it. Of course you want to have your spacing gauge. Never go anywhere without it. This is just a little piece of cording that I've put on my spacing gauge and I put a command hook on my machine and I actually hang it right there on the machine so it's always there even though I lose it and I have a couple of them so maybe you need to get another one. They're very valuable. And to make the actual web we're going to use the Spinet Echo number one. So this is a rotating template. It has pinholes. I put a little piece of glow line tape here. Sometimes I use painter's tape just so that I can find the holes a little bit easier. Sometimes depending on the lighting, it's just easier to see them and also to see the numbers, especially on light colored fabric. If I'm using dark colored fabric, I don't have that problem, but I'm going to use a cream fabric today. Also, when I first got this template, I put a label on it. It says mark 18 rotation, stop every other one. That helped me when I didn't know this template very well. So you can always do that on any of the templates or put a note inside the packaging to remind yourself how you want to use it. Stable tape is on the top and then down on the bottom. So that's where my stable tape went. The other thing you're going to need is the pin and that's going to go up through the fabric if you've never used one of these templates before and that's going to hold the spin echo for us. So the pin goes and it's going to rotate and that's going to help everything stay symmetrical. I just pop a pin more on my pins and you can also use like a clover clip works really well. Two. I use these a lot or a clothespin, even just a piece of tape like that. It just stops me from getting cut by the pin. I can be clumsy sometimes and I don't like blood so that's what I do. You're also going to want a marking pen. and some kind of ruler. I'm just using a straight ruler. A couple of other fun tools to have 
if you don't have them. And if you do, I'm going to show you how to use them. One is the spinning wave. This is number six. It makes a straight line, but they all come from the center of wherever your design is. So this is going to get the spokes in the spider web for us. So I'm going to show you how to use that. And also, there is the Circle Works Outer Rim Marker, or the Outer Rim Tool. It also has holes in it, but this is going to help us so that we know where to stop. So you can use a ruler or you can use this. If you like to do a lot of Mandela type designs or you mark a lot on your crosshairs, like you always mark up four inches here, you know where to stop. This is very valuable to do all of that. So we're going to put our tools aside and take them to the machine for when we need them. And we are going to put a few reference lines on our top fabric. So this particular fabric is larger than 17 by 21. Oh, the other thing you're going to want, sorry, is the pattern. So the pattern's going to be available. And it has the directions written down. And it also includes the shape for the spider and the placement of his legs. And I'm going to show you how you're going to use this later when we get to the spider. So I've already basted my fabric with the spray base because I didn't want to get any spray into my camera. And we're going to measure this. We need 17 by 21 and this is about 22. And this distance here is about 18 and a half. So I have a little leeway. Not a lot, but I have a little. So I'm going to mark a 17 by 21 inch area and that's just so that I know where I'm going to stop stitching. So I'm going to start here down on the bottom and I'm going to draw a line. One thing I'm going to say about marking sandwiches, if I can I try and mark the top before I've made the sandwich because I'll get a much sharper line. When this is squishy, and if you're not pushing on the ruler where you need to be, it can cause some problems. So I had a little ways I could come in here. And just because this is a, it was about 19. You can tell my fabric's not cut perfectly straight or I didn't draw perfectly straight. So again, I'm just keeping my hand down on the ruler where I'm doing my marking. So now I need to go 17 inches this way. Oh, I went way too far, didn't I? Hmm. 17 inches this way. It's 21 this way. Oh, I'm so confused. Sorry about that. I've been known to make mistakes. So there's that line. Again, I'm going to go all the way across. My salvage is down here as well, so I just wanted to make sure that I'm not in the salvage area. And if it's not exactly 21 inches, it's going to be fine. There we go. And now I'm going to go to the other side over here and this has to be 17 inches so I'm gonna take my 17 inches again if it's not perfect don't worry about it we don't want this to be stressful So this is the perimeter of where I'm going to be stitching. And I may or may not cut it a little bit more inside this line when I'm done. Because we, you know, 16 by 20. Now what I want is I want to have 4 inch vertical lines. And I, 
by forming I want them to be four inches apart. So I'm going to start on either side and I'm going to measure four inches and I'm going to draw a vertical line. Did you see that? Just right over my finger. Oops. Go four more inches. So the des background quilting is going to be a chevron design. And these are going to be the lines where I'm going to stop when I'm doing my quilting. So they're just reference lines for me to stop. And I have one more to make, so I'm going to go back to the other side again. I guess this is the original side, not the other side. And draw my lines. Now, I also need a place to stop when I'm doing my stitching. I want my chevrons to be at 90 degrees, so I need to go up the same distance this direction that these are separated by. Four inches. All I really need are tick marks on these lines. I don't need to draw it all the way across. I could if I wanted to, but I don't need them. Now, this here, I don't want to use this line. This is the edge. This is not a reference line for me. So I'm just going to kind of make a few little marks in it so I remember that I don't want to use that. So we are all marked and ready to go to the sewing machine. So next up, I will meet you at the machine. So here we are at the machine with our mark sandwich and we're going to start stitching our chevrons. And I want to stitch from these tick marks down to the intersection, remember this very first line that we made down here, with the vertical lines. And then we're going to stitch back up and down and up. One way you can do this is to put your needle in this intersection here, pull your threads there, put your template against your foot, and use your spacing gauge to line up down here. There's another way to do this and you get the exact same result. Sometimes it's not vital that things hit absolutely perfectly with what your um, when you're starting something out. So what I'm going to do is actually put the template against these two cross marks. So line the template up on that crosshair and then on this one down here. Now I'm going to stitch along the template. First I'm going to pull my threads and I'm pulling them outside the line just a little bit. Remember to hold your thread tails at the beginning. Check and make sure everything's good here. And I'm going to take a couple stitches. And now I'm going to stitch. I'm going to stop when I get to this reference line here. And that's why I drew the reference lines to go the entire length of the piece. I'm on that line. I now need to go up. So I'm going to move the fabric. Normally I don't move the fabric, but I want you to be able to see what I'm doing just in this very first section 
again I want to use I'm gonna have to back up a little bit so you can see this this tick mark here is the one that I'm using so I just take a stiletto and actually put it right in the mark and then I can put the template right up to it I've learned that that works pretty well um, especially when filming so you can see so now I'm going this direction I'm using a 12 inch arc I don't know if I stated that When I get to that reference line, I'm going to stop. I'm going to do the same thing going this direction. Again, putting the template right where those lines intersect. The key to a 90 degree chevron is that the distance between your vertical lines and the first tick mark is the same distance. So I'm going up here to this tick mark over here. And I'm going to stitch this way. I tried using cream thread, which is what I normally would do, but it didn't show up enough when I was filming that you could see what I was doing. Now, I don't have a reference line down here. I'm out of fabric. But th remember, this is the outside perimeter. This was a reference line. So I do need to stitch out to here. I'm going to use, and I hope you can see it, I'm going to use one of the vertical reference lines on my template. I'm going to put that on this stitch line. That will give me the angle that I need. So now I just stitch off into the seam allowance. I'm going to make my chevrons an inch apart. So you could just go up this way an inch and then keep stitching. The problem with that is all of this space down here is going to be left blank. I'm going to be up at the top. I'm either going to have to travel all the way back or I'm going to have to break my threads, pull them again at the bottom and redo that. I don't really want to do that. So what I'm going to do is do my I'm going to fill in this area down here before I continue going back to the top. So I told you in the beginning I made this line. That's just so I can see it on this fabric. Sometimes the reference lines are a little difficult to see on a very light colored fabric. So especially when you're holding it pretty far away so that other people can see what you're doing. So I'm putting that line on the previous stitch line. I'm going to move up here. And now I'm going to stop on that reference line. And I can just move my template and put it right back on the stitching lines again. That was off a little. It's in the corner. Maybe the spider will cover it up. I'm going to fill in this corner here.
see, I'm off just a little. Trust me, no one's ever going to know. And there, I went totally off the template. This little space down in here is not worth filling in. It's not enough, so we're going to travel along. We got bunched up a little. This is going to probably come out when I cut this off. That'll smooth out a little bit. So now we're going to fill in this section. Maybe you can see it better if I turn this way. Maybe I can see better too. Stop on this line. I'm filling in this little section. Whenever you're doing a fill like this, it's always faster to do it this way. And again, we're not going to bother with any more fill there. If you're new to ruler work, when you're traveling, I recommend that you use your template. So you kind of get a feeling. I've always said that template work is a feeling because you can actually feel the foot touching the template. And that goes on that one. And we just have a couple of lines to stitch in here. I lock these stitches, but I still may want to bury them, so I don't want to stitch over them. Now we're just going to do one inch spacing on these lines. I do want to make sure that I have enough template coverage down here that I'm still going to have a template when I hit that line. So the 12 inch arc is absolutely perfect for this spacing. with my head to make sure I've got enough room up there and I know I can go up a little higher there we go get my reference line on my stitches not always perfect But when you're 
doing a fill, sometimes you can get away with not being perfect all the time. So I'm just going to slide my template up a little bit. Sometimes when you can't see it's a little more difficult. using a size 90 needle. I go back and forth between 80 and 90 needle. I always recommend a size 90 needle for beginners. If you notice, I'm kind of changing up the way I hold the template. With this template, because it's so long, I like to have one of my hands off the side of the template and kind of hold it a little bit so that it doesn't, I don't accidentally move it. The stable tape is great. I just sometimes like that little extra security. So I've got a 90 top stitch in here and I'm using a polyester embroidery thread. So as you can see, I'm spacing these lines an inch apart by coming in on the third reference line because they're each a quarter of an inch. And if I need to check that I'm doing everything okay, if I'm off, see here, I'm off just a little bit. It's not exactly an inch all the way. I think this is the one that I messed up. So I'm just making sure by using this reference line that I'm perpendicular to that one over there. And that seems to be better. That's going to be really close up at the top. like about this template with straight lines is you can go in any direction. You go forwards, backwards, left, right, 45 degrees, 30 degrees, 90 degrees. After a while, it's just super relaxing. back I flipped it around and we're now at the very top I'm gonna do the same thing in here that I did on the other side to fill in 
this little area here. Stitching to the line. And instead of going there and doing this side, I'm going to fill in this triangle here. too far. There we go. Now, since this is at the end, I can just run a few stitches back and forth, and I can just actually cut them. So normally, I would pull and bury, but in this case, we can just cut that off. So, here are the chevrons all stitched. And as you can tell, there are some places where it got a little thinner, a little thicker, but overall, it doesn't jump out at you. So next up, we're going to mark for the spider web. We are back to mark for the spider web. We have our background all quilted. And the first thing we want to do is get the spider ready. So this is your spider and his legs. This is just the spider. I've traced him onto freezer paper. So freezer paper is smooth on one side and shiny on the other. And it makes it really nice because you can place your pattern on your fabric. I'm doing it on the wrong side. You can also do it on the right side. And just press a little with your iron. It helps if the iron is actually hot. Let's see if it's going to get on there. There we go. And now I'm going to let it cool. Now I can cut right along this line. This paper is not going to budge and I'm going to be able to cut out my spider. I'm not using fusible. And the reason I'm not using fusible on this is when I put applique down on something that's already been quilted, if you fuse it, sometimes the fabric fuses into the quilting stitches that are already there and I don't want to do that. So I'm going to cut along this line. Now I'm going to tell you a secret about cutting. 
I'm not the best cutter. It's a lot easier to get a smooth line on a circle if you move the paper, let me get down over here, and not the scissors. So as you can see, I'm rotating the paper. If you cut trying to move the scissors, you're going to get a really choppy line. So again, move the paper, not the scissors. And you will get a much smoother line. These scissors I have have a little texture to them and it actually helps grab the fabric. They're really nice. And then when I'm done cutting out my spider, I can take the paper off. See, he didn't get very smooth right there. It's because my iron wasn't super hot when I started this. There we go, there's our spider. So the paper comes right off. Next, I want to mark a spot for the center of my design. And I've done some math for you. I'm going to measure from seven and a half inches from the upper left hand corner from the top down and from the left in. So I'm going to put this here. You can use a regular ruler or a square ruler. Don't stress about this. It doesn't have to be absolutely perfect. And I'm just going to put a dot right there. That's going to help me for where I want to put the pinhole because the Spina Echo template that we are using uses the pin. So I'm going to open this. There's my pin and I'm going to pop it in from the bottom of my quilt sandwich. I like to put the pin in before I do my marking because I'm not always exact with my pin. There we go. So now we're going to mark 16 crosshair lines. Now, here's my spider, but I kind of want to know where his legs are because I don't want him to extend beyond here and I want him in a little bit. So, I either want them like this, or I want them like this. On the first one I did, he was climbing down, so this one I think I'm gonna do climbing up. So I kinda wanna get my spider a little placed. Doesn't have to be perfect. Just kinda the angle that I want him to come in at. So I wanna make sure that one of the spokes of the spider web actually goes to the spider. So I'm going to turn this a little. The other thing that I think is important when you're making spider webs, and this is just a personal design, is you don't want your spider web to be perfectly aligned with your quilt sandwich and have your spider come this way. I think it looks a lot better if it's angled a little bit. So let's put our spider back. And let's angle this a little. So if the web comes there, and my spider's there, look at that. I like that. So I think that's where we're going to go. So now I need to mark. Sorry, I had to walk away and get a pen. I want to pin this in place because I don't want to lose this yet. And just one little pin is going to work. I need to mark the spokes for the spider web. 
I'm going to use a different color than I used for the chevrons just so I don't get confused. And my pin is right in the middle. And I'm just going to mark my spokes. And one more. Now, on this template, if you remember, I had put a note on here that I need to mark 16 rotations. So, I need to turn this until this line, there we go, maybe you can see that better. This line here is on one of the lines that I've already marked. Put that back on my pin. Rotate this. There's the line. Line it up there. Line this one up. That one up. That's off just a skosh. There we go. And now these are the alternate ones. And now I'm going to take that off. So these are the reference lines that I need for my spider web. Now, this is the one that is going to go underneath the spider. So I know that has to be a spoke. And every other line needs to be a spoke. So I'm just going to put a little circle at the end of them so that I know those are my spoke lines. And, oh, I messed up, didn't I? Good thing my iron's on. I'm just going to get rid of this one right here. And this one. That's my spokes. So, the other thing I like to do when I'm using a pen is just pop a piece of tape over it. I use painter's tape. The reason that I do that is, number one, it helps me find it. And number two, it stops the pin from wiggling around. So, and then that's a caution. Pam, don't run your hand across that. You're going to hurt yourself. I don't want to do that. So now we need to do some math. And let me show you the design here. So I've already done the measurements. From here to here is approximately 12 inches. I like to have this extend at least an inch a little bit more. So now we have 12 inches plus an inch plus an inch, a little bit more, say an inch and a quarter. Oh my gosh, we're getting into some really complicated math here. So I want to end up where this point to this point is about 14 and a half inches. So now I have to do half of that to get to the center. Oh my gosh, half of 14 and a half, oh, is seven and a quarter. Okay. People don't always like the math. I need to mark out on the ends of my spokes where I want those lines to end. So I can take a ruler and go from the center, find seven and a quarter, find my little spoky thing, make myself a line, or I can use this. So this is the outer rim marker. And again, you probably can't see it because I need some dark fabric. Here we go. This is the outer rim tool marker. It has numbers on it for you that tell you from this pinpoint, if you go all the way out, that's how large your design's going to be. How cool is that? You don't ever have to measure with a ruler. You can just use this. I've marked it here at 14 and a half. I'm going to put that right on my pin. And if I twirl it around, all of my lines are going to be exactly where I need them to be to get a 14 and a half inch design. So I need to mark my spokes. Well, shoot, this doesn't go far enough. It's okay because I just need a little tick mark. 
that's where I'm going to end. I'm going to go this way. If you like to do symmetrical designs using different templates, this is the neatest tool that has ever existed. I absolutely love it. This one, he's going to have to come under here. So I'm just going to pull this back and know that I need to start about there. That's underneath the spider where I'm going to start. This is actually the starting position for the entire design. And I have a couple more spokes to mark. Again, it doesn't go far enough. Don't worry about it. And this one. So now we have our stopping point for our spokes. And we know exactly where to stop. The other thing we need to do is to figure out on the spoke on the very first one, because we're actually going to start here and stitch this way, we need a stopping point. Oh my goodness. There's a lot of guessing in there. May or may not be good at it. I'm not good at it. I prefer not to guess. So you can do this part if you want to. I'm going to put this on the very first pinhole. And I know that this is the line that my spoke is going to be on. So I want the center of this template to be on the next line. So this line corresponds to this one over here. And the little dots that are on here, I'm going to place that. And that's another reason that I put this glow line tape underneath it. It helps me to see where these dots are. So I'm going to stop on this point and here, because I'm going to stop every other one. Oh my goodness. How am I going to do that? I have two options. One is I can mark with my pen the edge of the template. That's not exactly the edge. There we go. And I know that when I stitch here, that's where I want my foot to stop. The other thing I can do is use a stitching line desk and know that I'm going to stitch a pro there. So this now becomes where I want my needle to stop when I'm stitching this line because this template won't be in place when I'm stitching that line. So if you don't have the stitching line discs, I want to encourage you to get them. You get a bunch of them. You can see mine are all dark. They hold pencils. They hold Crayola twistable crayons. They hold the markers. They're just the best. And I use them a lot to audition designs, figure out how things are going to line up. So for example, this is how I played with this design to figure out the math. So I really like them. And we are now ready to go to the sewing machine. I'm going to actually leave my spider on here and we will stitch out the spider web and learn how to do the legs.